Okay, so Judges chapter 17. You know, generally speaking, the book of Judges is kind of a tragic book. You see Israel really at the depths of depravity. Somehow, though, God is still with them. God is still working in their midst, but they do not cover up their depravity. So there's nothing glossed over. It's all clearly written down for all to see. It's just amazing, Samson, when you read his story, this called from his mother's, before his mother's room, and, you know, and set apart to the Lord and anointed with great power, but his life was a tragedy. However you look at it, his life was a tragedy. The amazing thing is that God used him anyway. In spite of the, his tragic choices and his downfall, you know, because of his own sin, um, God's hand was still upon him, and God was using him in spite of himself, which is really amazing. But I, ha- I, I think that's a good picture to look at. When you start to see a lot of the errors in theology, maybe that are prevalent, or a lot of errors in Christianity, modern-day Christianity, it can often lead to a, another extreme where you just feel like, you know, God is not anywhere. People don't even, I, I meet people, I don't really meet them in person, more online. They see some of my videos and they say, they don't go to church because the church is too corrupt. I'm like thinking, give me a, that's not the right, the, the church is so corrupt, there's no good church in my hometown, and I just don't, I don't see it that way. I don't see it that we're, the church is so corrupt, I mean, unless it's flying the rainbow flag, then yeah, run, you know, or, you know, if they're worshiping statues of Mary, yeah, then run, don't go, but, or unless they're saying that Jesus is not really the Son of God, he's just an angel, yeah, run, don't go, but I'm saying is, you know, as long as the doctrine is still according, basically, According to the Bible, it doesn't have to be perfect doctrine. There's no church with perfect doctrine. And as long as the people are at least trying to serve God, it's better to go somewhere than nowhere. And uh, some people, they, they have this idea, this mentality that everything is so bad, it's so wrong, so let's run to the hills. Those people usually are deceived. They usually end up deceived. They usually end up in a really bad spiritual state. Um, and um, so... So I'm trying to bring the balance here where I got saved and how I got saved was not a perfect church or a perfect movement. In fact, I don't even know if I could say that I would agree with what their method is to this day. I believe in a very simple method. I believe in simple gospel preaching. I don't really believe in a lot of gimmicks or or techniques to lead people to Christ. I believe in just the Basically, the pure word of God, just preaching simple evangelism. I believe that that's the biblical method. That's the one that's, you know, there's people that use a lot of techniques, and I don't agree with most of it, to be honest. But God used it anyway. God uses it still. He used it in my life. I wouldn't be saved. I went to an imperfect church, and one of the churches that changed my life the most was completely an error, completely in error with prosperity theology and a false emphasis on money and all these other things. And, but God used this church in my life. There's just no used it in my whole family's life. And so you have to take it all in balance when you start seeing like, well, there's a lot of error. There's a lot of, dis- there's a lot of things that are wrong. Yeah, that's true. And at the same time, at the same time, look at Samson. This guy's life was a tragedy basically from beginning to end. But the hand of God was upon him. His motives were never pure. Look at, you know, God called Samson and God used Samson. But his motives were wrong in every move he made. And yet God used every move he made. That's just what blows my mind. Remember the first thing he wanted was to marry a Philistine. Get me that woman. And his parents are like, can't you get a woman from amongst your own people? You're not supposed to go to these Philistines. It's a sin. It's a compromise. No, give me that woman. And it says in the verse, the following verse, that the parents did not know that God was in this thing. What? God is in Samson choosing the wrong wife? How does that work? I don't know fully. I know it's sin. I know it's forbidden by God. But God somehow was even bigger than that and said, okay, Samson has his own sinful motives. But in spite of that, I'm still going to use him. And he did, and he used him to kill a bunch of Philistines, which was God's purpose at the time. He did it over and over again. Samson goes into a prostitute. Samson goes for a Delilah. It's all wrong. It's all sin. And God used it every time, even the very end. What is Samson crying out for? Vengeance on my enemies for my two eyes. Give me a break. That's the utter height of sinfulness. And God used it to kill more Philistines in his death than he did in his whole life. 
How does that work? I don't know, but I know one thing. No matter how dark things get, God will not leave this earth until the very end. I know how matter, how, how, however dark the churches may be or whatever may be the case, I know one thing, that God is not going to leave the church. He's not going to leave without a witness of his, the, the priesthood can be corrupted, the pastors can be in error, there can be so many things, but I tell you what, God is still going to be working. God is still going to be saving souls, he's going to be healing people's lives, he's going to be working miracles, um, because he's not going to forsake everybody until the end, you know, behold, I'm with you forever, even until the end of the age, I'm with you always, even till the end of the age. So that's a promise that, you know, we've seen horrible times in church history, the whole Catholic age, you know, basically a thousand years of darkness, bad darkness. Personally, I don't think the Reformation was much better than the the Catholic stuff. It was just as wicked, but just in a different way. That's probably controversial for some people, but I have the facts to prove it. But anyway, it's a whole other topic. But at least with the Reformation, they recognized the Catholic form was wrong. The idolatry was wrong. All the corruption of the priesthood was wrong. Problem was, I think some of the reformers, they liked the power for themselves, and so they became the new popes in a sense, you know. But there was the Anabaptist movement. That was a pure movement, largely. They were simple. They were gospel preaching, Bible believing. They were not into all the power of the popes and all that sort of thing. So they were not these super erudite theologians, theological types like the reformers who were more focused on theology than holy living, etc. Anyway, Darkness prevails, but God is alive. Jesus is alive. So um, maybe we're in another dark age. I know from most people's perspective, wow, the gospel's spreading all around the world. For me, the question sometimes is what sort of gospel is spreading? Because if it's a false gospel, remember, there was a counter-reformation. With the, when the Reformation happened, the Catholics got zealous once again, and they sent out their counter-reformation missionaries all over the world. That's how you got the Jesuits, <laughs> Right? That's how you get the Jesuit schools in Singapore, in Malaysia, Indonesia, all over these nations. From the, they, what, what was their whole goal? To stop Reformation Christianity. And of course, I'm not fully on board with Reformation Christianity, but at least they had some basic principles were correct. They at least understood that salvation is by faith through grace. They understood it's not through the, the Catholic system. They knew they, they were against idolatry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they had some basic things that were correct, far more true than the Catholic, and people were getting saved by it. People get saved by it. I don't think very many people get saved in Catholic churches, to be honest. Why? Well, if you're not preaching the, the clear gospel, you're just presenting people with a bunch of religious forms and ideas and concepts. You don't get saved like that. You don't get saved by attending a religious system. You get saved by a personal encounter with the living God. You get saved by a personal encounter with the truth of God. And in particular, when you're not saved, it's a concerning your sin and your need for salvation, your need of the blood of Jesus, your need for repentance, your need of eternal life, and the, prop- the provision of God through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ the Lord. So this message has to be preached for people to be saved. You could grow up in church, you can go to Christian school your whole life, and if you never hear this clear message about salvation, it's very possible you live and die and perish forever. Because you've got to be confronted with certain elements of the Word of God, not just the general Word of God. We say, we need to preach the full counsel of God. That's true, but what does Paul mean when he uses that term? The full counsel of God doesn't mean every single Bible verse, although if we can do that, let's do it. But he preached to the, that's in Ephesus, the full counsel, meaning the full counsel, the the whole gospel message, the focus of what it's all about. That's the whole counsel of God. The priorities, the truths that are pressing, and you'll see what those are when you read, for example, through the book of Acts, and you'll see this is the message they, pre- they presented. This is the message they preach, and, it's, and it does not vary. I mean, certain, certain things vary a, a little bit, but it's always focused around Jesus Christ, always focused about, uh, around the fact that he is the Son of God. They maybe use a different term, but it's always around his identity as the Messiah or the Son of God, the, the Lord, and he rose from the dead. He died and rose from the dead. Therefore, repent for forgiveness of sins. So, Samson was a tragedy. That's chapter 16. But in chapter 16, you see the depravity, I guess, in the sense of Samson, a man of God, yet his 
character and his morals are gutter level. He has no morals. He has no character. He does what he wants. It's disgusting. It's wrong. It's wicked. And God judges him for it. No question about that. But somehow, during that period, because that's all that there was, God was working through him, even doing miracles through him. So we have to be careful. We can get into a sort of a mindset where our standards are like sky high. So in other words, if this person doesn't have perfect theology, then God cannot be with them. Or if this person is not perfect in their character or in their life in every way, then God is not with him. Now, I agree we should be perfect in our theology as far as we can be. We should be perfect in our character and our morals as far as we can be. We should be perfect as much as we can be, but the reality is if we make that standard, that's higher than the Bible itself. Do you understand what I'm saying? That God is using these people in spite of the fact that they fall short. We can't deny that. And so what I'm saying is this. When we judge a, a movement or a miracle or a church order, we should be very careful to pronounce everything as that's the devil. That's not God. Why? Well, we just don't know sometimes. Well, but I know this guy. I mean, my general principle is this. For example, if I evaluate a church movement and I consider that their theology is aberrant, their theology is completely off the foundation of what we would consider historical Orthodox Christianity. In general, out of a movement like that, I don't accept their testimonies of miracles or angelical appearances, etc. Why? Because I, don't, I think that the purpose of miracles is to confirm the Word of God. And if they're not really preaching the Word of God, we have to be very suspicious of the miracles that are coming out of such movements. Do you know that the, some of the Anabaptist leaders were previously... Catholic priests before they were converted. And they had records. I think when, I don't remember the exact figure, it was like 65 recorded miracles that took place in their Catholic church before their idols, with all their idolatrous stuff, they had real miracles taking place. The question is, where was that power coming from? Obviously, it was not the power of God. Why? They're worshiping an idol. They're bowing before statues. They're not, I mean, it's just totally wrong. So that's a very clear-cut scenario. So my general stance is, yeah, if the source is corrupted, then the miracles are corrupted. But in certain cases, it's not all black and white. We have to be careful. I think that that's the way it is with a lot of churches in Indonesia, where there's a lot of focus on miracles. How much of that is real? How much is it not? I don't know. But we should be careful before we make quick judgments, because God can meet with somebody anywhere at any time. And he does not have to use a perfect vessel. And in another sense, we should thank God for that, that God doesn't have to use perfect vessels because that means that he could use you and me. Because if the standard is perfect theology or the standard is perfect life or perfect this or perfect that, then we're all hopeless as far as being used by God. So, but again, we strive for perfection, amen? And, uh, and we do not make this as an excuse or an example. We look at it as something to lament over, that, that the level of spirituality was so low in Israel that God had to use someone like Samson. That's a tragedy. But... There is light, in a sense, in chapter 16, because you see the power of God manifest. Chapter 17 is worse. Chapter 17 is worse. We see sort of an exposition of the utter depths of the corruption of religion. That's what we see. We see, it's just, it's like a, how shall I say, it's like a, I, I can't think of the words, dissection, dissecting the, the corrupt picture of what religion has become in Israel. So let's start from uh, chapter 17. I'm going to read through this, starting in verse 1. Now, there was a man from the mountains of Ephraim whose name was Micah. So notice in this uh, section, there's going to be three main players. Uh, Micah is the first one. 
And he said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and on which you put a curse, even saying it in my ears, here's the silver with me. I took it. This is a funny thing. He stole his mom's silver. Look what his mom says. And his mother said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my son. <laughs> this is, <laughs> what? Okay, I mean, he's, he stole your money and he gave it back. Okay. Uh, so when he had returned the 1,100 shekels and silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son. Well, that's a good thing. Um, I guess when it, was, it disappeared, she said something like, if, it, you know, if I get it back, it's all going to be the Lord's, something like that. She dedicated to who? The Lord. For, and what's she going to do with it? Listen to this. This is, this is where it gets weird. To make a carved image and a molded image. What? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt make no graven image. No, this is the second commandment. But notice the confusion in her mind. She's doing it for the Lord. How is she going to serve the Lord? <laughs> Through making a carved image and a molded image. Now, therefore, I will return it to you. Thus, he returned the silver to his mother. Then his mother took 200 shekels of silver. Oh, wait, wait, wait. How much did she dedicate to the Lord? All. But how much is she actually giving now? 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the silversmith. How does that work? Well, you know, God will understand. It doesn't have to be all of it. Listen, when you don't know the true God and you just have a vague idea of God, you can always convince yourself of anything. You can make a vow, but you know, that vow, it doesn't really, I mean, God understands. I don't really have to keep the vow, you know. I mean, it's like 1,100, 200. God does not need the money. So, so I know I promised my life to God. I know I promised everything I had to God. But you know, God understands. And besides, they're not treating me the way they should, so I don't have to fulfill my parts, whatever the excuse is. But I just noticed that part. I'm like, okay, you said... 1100 and now it's 200 okay i get it that's how people deal with their idols don't they so she took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the silversmith and he made it into a carved image and a molded image and they were in the house of micah the man micah had a shrine and made an ephod and household idols. Man, that's very Feijang Feng Fua. That is very, he's got, enough, I mean, he's got like more than enough. A shrine, so he's got like a little temple there, you know. And then he's got um, an ephod, like the, the garment that the priest would wear, you know, the holy garments of the priesthood. And he's got um, household idols. Well, this is bonus. I mean, this is not really supposed to be there, but, you know, just in case this God doesn't work, I've got these gods on the side as well to help me out. Household idols, teraphim. And not only that, he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Look at the note the author makes. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now notice what's happening here. He is attempting to serve God. He is attempting to worship God according to something that he knows about somewhere, but it's all blurry, it's all fuzzy, it's all hazy, it's all cloudy. In, in Shiloh, there is a tabernacle. But God never said, you just make your own tabernacle. No, God forbid, that's a, that, that's a sin unto death. You will die for, how dare you, copy copy the holy tabernacle of God. God gave that to Moses, and they specifically made it according to a certain way and everything. The worship is supposed to take place there. But this guy, he's dark. He's confused. He's far from the reality of God, although he's got a vague idea because he's copying the ideas that he's heard. He's got a temple. That's a shrine. He's got an ephod. Those are the clothes that the priest would wear. The idols, I have no idea where that came from. It just goes to show, though, when you're lost, you're lost. And everything looks the same. And then, this is shocking, he consecrated one of his sons. One of his sons, are you kidding? How could you possibly, 
consecrate one of your sons. You know, later in the history of Israel, one of the kings went in to the temple to offer sacrifices, and he broke out in leprosy. You, not only can you, you can't even draw near to the temple in that fashion, but this guy is so darkened, he has lost sight. He does not see clearly. Um, he's doing whatever was right. In his own eyes. So he, this is player number one, Micah. Remember Micah, this man, okay? Micah's the man with his own temple, with his own altar, his own ephod, and his own priest. That's perfect. He's like got his own God. His own, I mean, it's right there in his home. How convenient. In verse 7, now, there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah. He was a Levite and was staying there. This is a Levite. So this man does belong in the, in the temple and all those sorts of things. Verse, but he seems to not be content with that. Why? Well, the man departed from the city of Bethlehem in Judah to stay wherever he could find a place. He's looking for a better life. He's looking for more money to be made. He was not content with his wages there in Jerusalem or wherever he was in Judah. He was not content with what they gave him because the Levites would get their portion. Moses assigned them a portion according to the law. So they would serve in the tabernacle, etc., and they would have their, their wages, etc. They could live off that, but for some reason, he is not content with that. He goes wandering about looking for something greater. So he came to the mountains of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? So he said to him, I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm on my way to find a place to stay. Micah said to him, dwell with me, and I will be a father and a priest to you, and I will give you 10 shekels of silver per, per year, a suit of clothes, and your sustenance. So the Levite went in. Then the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. The Levite is the second player in this drama, the second actor in this drama. We have a man who's hungry for religion. Who's that? Micah. What's his motive? He tells us in verse, 30, in verse 13. Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as a priest. He is seeking blessing. He is seeking blessing. And he's going about it in a completely confused, uh, corrupt, sinful way. His motive in all of his religiosity is what? Blessing. What sort of blessing? Clearly not spiritual blessing. He has no idea about such things. His mindset is this world. His mindset is that all goes well for him and his family and his finances, his health, his children, his crops. What's different between that and a pagan Philistine? Nothing. It's exactly the same. The same motive, the same mindset, the same pursuit. And we hear, we have the Levite. What's the Levite's motive in religion? Notice we're talking about religion, the corruption of religion, and we're dealing with the motive. What is their motive? Micah's motive is he wants physical, material blessings. He wants prosperity. He wants nigga food. He wants the the char Chinese character hung upside down over his door. He wants blessing to pour out upon him. <clears throat> what does the Levite want? He wants a better income. This Levite, shouldn't he know that he can't be consecrated as a priest in this idolatrous altar? He might know it. He might not. He doesn't care. It doesn't matter for him. Why? Because he's making a good living out of it. And he must feel like, like many people who are involved in the religious um, industrial complex, the religious business world, well, we're helping people. We're not hurting people. 
If there's a little bit of compromise here and there, that's okay. God understands. After all, we're doing good. We're talking to people about God. We're trying to persuade them to be good people. So it doesn't matter if we're right or wrong, if we have the right, if we have the right practices, we have the right doctrines, we have the right lifestyle. That doesn't really matter because after all, you know, we're, we're talking to people about God and we're teaching, we're being kind to people and it doesn't really matter. God does not care about the little details, right? But the, at the ultimate motive here of this Levite is gain. It's sheer gain. And now in the New Testament, the false teachers are noted for the heart for gain. That's the number one sign of a false teacher, that their heart is for greed, for money, gain, wealth, prosperity, fame, popularity. That's the number one sign of a false teacher. In fact, now this is not the New Testament, but it's during the time of the New Testament, there was a document called the Didache, which means the teaching of the 12. We don't know who wrote it. It probably wasn't one of the apostles, but maybe an associate of the apostles. Anyway, some early church leader wrote this document. And at that time, there was traveling prophets that would go from church to church. And in this document, it's, very, it's not very long. You can read it. You can find it online and read it. But it actually says that if someone comes to you, a prophet comes to you and asks for money, you immediately reject them as a false prophet. All, everything with money was very sensitive. They were very clear about it. If they stay with you longer than three days, reject them. They're a false prophet. I mean, why? Because there was this, the false prophets were after gain. They're after money. The true prophets, they didn't know they just served God. Their focus was not on material things. Their focus was not on the wealth of this world. But the false ones always use religion as a guise to cover their greed. So they use religion as a means to obtain worldly things. That's the sign of a false teacher or a false prophet, that their true motive is something else. It might not be money. It could be influence. It could be power. What I've seen in religious movements and I've seen throughout church history, and I've seen it to some degree in modern times, I believe that like when there's a big scandal breaking and some very famous um, teacher or Bible teacher or pastor is being exposed, a bunch of people will come around him and try to cover the sin in an ungodly way. I don't mean in a good way, like, well, let's try to... Res-. I mean, they just try to make it, no, no, there's nothing here, don't look, there's nothing here. I wonder why... Do they do such things? And I'm convinced. I don't think it's all, some people say, well, they're just after the, they want money and if this guy goes down, their whole industry goes down. No, no. I think it's more about influence. Because this, what this person represented, you know, there's a bunch of people going down recently, famous pastors from different church backgrounds. If you follow that stuff, it's kind of scary. It's not one church, it's not only charismatic, or it's, it's, it's charismatic, it's evangelical, it goes across the board, different church backgrounds. And I'm convinced that the reason why people, other leaders that are sort of famous and they run in those circles, they try so hard to cover them, one of the main reasons is because they want to maintain influence. Influence. But anyway... This Levite has got an impure motive. And we can see it that crystal clear. So the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. So how can this be wrong? They're so happy together, right? Make that the standard of everything. Does it work? This is like modern thinking. As long as it works, it's good. No, that's not true at all. Most biblical things, if you do them right, according to the Bible, they don't work unless God blesses them, and then they'll work. The methods that, that do work are usually against the Bible. The way to win, fl- win friends and influence people, etc. The ways that work go against the Scripture. Never criticize people. That's not biblical. That's one of the rules. Win friends and influence people. Never criticize people. Always use sort of encouraging words, but never bring out anything negative. That's not biblical. The Bible says that we are to, the Bible speaks of Micah the prophet was filled with the Spirit of the Lord to declare to Israel their sin. So he was filled with the Holy Spirit for the purpose of exposing their sin. And the Bible says in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes to bring conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. 
And we know that the apostles were not sent out until they'd received the Holy Spirit. And we see the result is that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, when they preached, the Spirit came and brought deep conviction of sin. What must we do to be saved? They, they cried out because they realized we crucified the Son of God, our Messiah. We've sinned against God. They were, in a sense, desperate. There's no hope. We, we, there's, we, we crucified God, the one God sent to us, the Savior God sent to us. That was good. God wanted them to come to a point of despair. He could conv- so he could convict them deeply and transform them and truly lead them to uh, surrender and obedience. Okay, so we've got these, the first two actors in our drama here. Micah, he wants religion for blessing, and the Levite, who wants blessing to make a living, and they work together perfectly. Do you notice that? That's why, I don't know who said it first. I've heard different people say it. I've heard Paul Washer say this. Other people have said it. That um, you cannot blame the false teachers and say these horrible, wicked, false teachers over all these poor sheep that are following them. The reality is they work together. The false preachers preach a message that tickles the ear. They give them a sort of a comfort, a false comfort, but it's a comfort, and that's what the people want to receive. They work together. And so the point is is that God raises up false teachers for people that don't want the truth. They want blessing without purity. They want God without following God's ways. They want salvation without obedience. They want guidance without surrender. They want all the blessings you can get from God without having to give up your old life. Wouldn't that be the best of both worlds? <laughs> you can keep your own lo- old life and still have all the blessings of God. No, that would not be. Why? Because when you know how bad sin is and the corruption of the flesh and, the, and the, how f- terrible sin, you don't want it anymore. You don't want it anymore. You hate it. It's despicable. It's dirty. It's unclean. It's corrupting. It's defiling. If somebody's really tasted and seen that the Lord is good, you don't want that old stuff anymore. I'm not saying you can't be tempted by it or even fall into it, but I'm saying that something deep within you is saying, God, I want a pure heart, clean hands and a pure heart. I I don't want to live in sin anymore. I've heard many people Old, older, older saints uh, come to a place in their lives where they said, Lord, even if I perish, even if I go to hell, I'm going to serve you. Even if I don't, I don't make, I don't have eternal life, I don't go to heaven when I die, I'm not going to live in sin. Do you feel that determination in your heart? I do. Sin is horrible. And holiness is beautiful. Righteousness is good. It's clean. It's the right thing. It's the right way. We were made to live godly lives. We were made to live righteous lives. We were made to live holy lives. And it's kind of a test of the heart, isn't it? So why are we actually serving God? What is our goal out of all this? Is it just to get out of the fire of hell? Well, I won't say that's a bad motive, okay? <laughs> because Jesus talked about hell. And he said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And I think the greater danger of today is that most of us, we're not afraid of hell. 
we think of hell as kind of some random, maybe like, I don't know, the Chinese concept of hell at different levels, and just, just it's kind of like you got like Sun Wukong goes down, to, you know, and just he can overcome the, what's his name, the Yen Shema, Shema Yen Wang, huh? Luo? Shaba. Anyway, that one. And uh, it's like, it makes it like a joke, right? Kind of like, like a fairy tale. The reality is it's not true. The reality is hell is, is terrible and it's real. The reality is it's something that we should truly tremble at, even if we're not going there. Just the concept of it, just the thought that people are going to hell. It should be something that moves us. I know at times in my life it's been a strong, I mean, when I got saved, that was a strong motivation. And other times in my life, the reality of other people going to hell was a strong motivation to me to serve God, to give my life to God, to say, God, please, here I am, send me, use me, send me to China, send me to the Chinese. I want, Lord, send me. That was my prayer. I thought of all people going to hell forever and ever and ever. I had no, I, no, uh, no other motive, no other plans, no other, I just put, God, at least let me save some. Let me save, well, actually, I want to save many, not a few. Save many. Because, you know, I, I thought of it, you know, a lot of times when people come to our church or visitors, they will look and say, oh, you guys, this is all you have, huh? They'll say, oh, you don't have very many people in your church, do you? That's not very many people, huh? And it's almost like sometimes people use that to kind of like, it's kind of like an indirect criticism. You, you must kind of be failing or something, you know? And it's like, I, what I want to say to that is how, how it despises the value of one human soul. You understand? We're not dealing with, like, cattle here. We're dealing with a precious human soul. How precious is one? Every single one of you in here is going to live forever in one place or the other. It would be worth it. It would be worth it for one person to give their whole life to God and to serve you, one of you if the result will be you will end up in eternal life in heaven rather than in hell. It would be worth it because one soul is precious. So there was a, a criminal who was going, he was being taken to the gallows to be hung in England for murder. And they had a, one of the Anglican priests behind him reading out of a prayer book, just kind of half asleep. And the wicked will be turned into hell. And the guy stopped. The criminal was a complete atheist, or just a completely hardened, murderous man. Stopped and said, what did you just read? And the guy was kind of afraid because the guy's a murderer. He murdered many people. Uh, I, I just, it's out of the book of common prayers. Well, what did it say? Read it again. He said that, that the dead will be, that the wicked will be turned into hell. And he says, you mean to say to me that if I die without Jesus Christ and in a few minutes my head's going to be taken off and I'm going to drop down from those gallows and once I drop into that pit, I will not drop just into the pit, but I will keep falling and falling and falling into hell forever and ever and ever and ever. And the guy's like, well, that's what I've been taught. And he's like, he scoffs. I don't believe that. Neither do you. He said, if I believed that, I would crawl on my hands and knees over glass from one end of England to the other to rescue one perishing sinner. Sometimes sinners can preach. And he was right. One soul, one life is precious. Amen? Don't you think your life is precious? I know it is to you. I know your life is desperately precious to you yourself. Not only your life, but my life as well. And the person next to you, every life is precious. Otherwise, Jesus would have never given his blood to die for us. 
Amen. Okay, so we need to move on to the next actor in our drama here, chapter 18. I'm going to start in um, verse 1. In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the Danites was seeking an, an inheritance for itself to dwell in. For until that day their inheritance among the tribes of Israel had not fallen to them. So the children of Dan sent five men of their family from their territory, men of valor from Zorah and Eshtal, to spy out the land and search it. They said to them, Go search the land. So they went to the mountains of Ephraim to the house of Micah and lodged there. While they were at the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. They turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What do you have here? So maybe they heard his accent, or maybe they knew him from the past. We're, we're not sure, but somehow they recognized, hey, you're not from this area. W what's the story here? He said to them, thus and so Micah did for me. He's hired me, and I have become his priest. <laughs> He's so, so just bold about it, right? Just so like, I'm a hired, hired man, a hired priest, a hired pastor. That's disgusting, I heard a story of a preacher, Baptist preacher, first sermon, second sermon. His first sermon was an utter disaster. But he went into another church, um, a young guy, and he preached his second sermon. And afterwards, a guy came up to him and offered him a check. He's like, what's that? He said, it's a check. For what? He said, for so-and-so, such-and-such an amount. He said, why? He said, for preaching. And the, the, the new preacher, he got very angry, said, how dare you? Try to buy me with filthy lucre. You're trying to buy me with your money. He said, never will I ever preach the free gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ for money. And then in the same sermon after that, he says, however, since that day, many of my positions have changed. <laughs> no, he's, the, the essence is the same. In other words, the preaching is not for money but he would take an offering later on, okay. But I want to say this. I mean, it's the same for me. And in fact, to this day, if I go to a church and preach and they want to give me an offering, I always feel awkward. And many times I, I don't take it at all. I give it back. Maybe it's not that I don't need the money. I just don't want to take money for preaching. It's not that I don't want the money, <laughs> but I don't want to, Maybe I need it, but I don't want to take money for preaching. Why? I just don't think that it, if you cannot look at this as a, as a money-making thing. It's not. And the moment that it becomes that, it's idolatry, it's wickedness, it's depravity, it's, it's not pure religion. <laughs> anyway, where am I at here? Thus, so Micah did for me. He's hired me and I become his priest. I want to tell a story. I shouldn't tell the story, but I'm going to tell the story. When I was a young young missionary, just, just, I think, about to be sent out to the field. This was like over, over 20 years ago. At our church, we had a conference, and two of the guest speakers, I, I was to dinner with them. They were like really great preachers and all this, so I was like really flattered to be able to go to dinner with them. And, and I remember one was a missionary, the other was a, in an itinerant, like evangelist preacher, and we went to dinner, and you know, all that those guys talked about was how much they got in their offerings. And they were complaining about the churches that would not give them offerings. I was disgusted. I was like, what in the heck are these guys talking about? They're off. And I know they're off. I don't know about the one guy now, but I know the other guy is totally off. And I think he's off for years. How can it be? How can it be? What about trusting God? What about praying to God? What about believing in God? Anyway. Let's see, where do we read to? Verse 4, right? Okay, verse 5. So they said to him, Please inquire of God that we may know whether the journey on which we will go to will be prosperous. And the priest said to them, Go in peace. The presence of the Lord will be with you on the way. Well, the Danites are religious. The Danites are religious. They want blessing. They want guidance. Inquire of God 
that we may know whether the journey on which we go will be prosperous. And the priest said to them, go in peace. The presence of the Lord will be with you on your way. I'm like, wondering how did he know that? Was it a lucky guess or what? I don't know. But it turned out to be true. And these Danites came back. And look in, uh, they came back to, to conquer the Sidonians. When they came back, verse um, 14, then the five men who had gone to spy out the country of Laish answered and said to the brethren, do you know that there are in these houses an ephod, an ephod household idols, a carved image, and a molded image? Whoa, man, that's like the jackpot. All these religious paraphernalia, all these artifacts, we'll surely be blessed if we get that in our hands. All these forbidden objects. See how confused they were? They had received the law of Moses. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any car, any uh, xiang. You should not, I forget in English. But anyway, you guys get the picture, right? Graven images. Should not make any graven images. But they won them. So they turned aside there and came to the house of the young Levite man, to the house of Micah. Now we got all three players. We've got Micah, we've got the Levite, we've got the Danites. And they're all focused on the same thing, religion. And greeted him, the 600 men armed with their weapons of war. They're going to steal the house of God. That's interesting. What about morality? Thou shalt not steal. False religion has no morals. So they're armed with their weapons of war. And then, okay, they stood by the entrance of the gate. Verse 17, Then the five men who had gone to spy out the land went up. Entering there, they took to the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the molded image. The priest stood at the entrance of the gate with 600 men who were armed with weapons of war. When these went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the molded image, the priest said to them, What are you doing? This is my livelihood. This is my income. This is where I work. You think he was concerned about the glory of God? I think not. And they said to him, be quiet. Put your hand over your mouth and come with us. Be a father and a priest to us. Is it better for you to be a priest to the household of one man or that you be a priest to a tribe and a family in Israel? Well, what do you think, guys? Which is better? More is better. Amen. More is always better. Gain, increase, prosperity, influence, money, position, power. So the priest, look at this. So the priest's heart was glad. And he took the ephod, the household idols, and the carved image and took his place among the people. How do you think Micah's going to feel about this? <laughs> oh, he did not like it. He did not like it. He cried out, verse 24. I'm just skipping over parts. So he said to him, you've taken away my gods, yep. which I made. Yep. And the priest, and you have gone away. Now what more do I have? And they threatened to kill him, so he let him go. And just skip down to verse uh, 30. Then the children of Dan set up for themselves the carved image and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh. And his sons were priests to the, tribe, the, to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up for themselves Micah's carved image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. This is astounding. Now, this is interesting, verse 30. I'm not sure on this. It could go either way. I haven't had time to look it up in detail, but... Verse 30, the children of Dan set up for themselves the carved image. So those are Micah's idols. Notice it never names the Levite. So either now it's giving the name of the Levite, his name is Jonathan, the son of Gershom, or they cut him out and found another one. (laughs) I kind of like to think they cut him out and found another one because it kind of makes it funny, doesn't it? I mean, he gave it all up and lost it all, right? He gave up the little for the more and lost it. If that's not what happened here, that sort of thing happens all the time, doesn't it? But what we see here is the state 
of religion in Israel at that time. And let's just look at a couple principles concerning this sort of religion. Number one, the false form of Christianity, that's what we're dealing with today, is always what we call utilitarian. Utilitarian. Like, in Chinese, that would be gong li. Gong li, utilitarian. I, it, I, I don't know another word in English that quite captures the idea. But false religion is for me, myself, and I. In other words, false religion is for the sake of gain, convenience, personal prosperity, and personal well-being. In other words, this God that I'm supposed to be serving actually exists to serve me. And that's exactly what we see in this picture here. All three of these individuals or these parties involved, the God that they're serving or supposed to be serving, they consider him as a God to serve them. They have no idea of the true God. They have a very vague and distant concept, but it's so blurred Everything that bleeds through is pure humanism, pure self-centeredness, sheer paganism, nothing more. And much of the modern gospel preaching has catered to this very thing. What do people want? People want the same things that these people wanted by nature. They want security, they want prosperity, they want blessing, they want guidance, they want protection, they want well-being. That's what everybody wants. Why do so many Chinese households put those things over, the mirror over the door, for example, or the fu zhou, I don't know what the word is in English, but you know those, the cloth things with the whatever on it. The, 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 what, are, what are they doing? What is this for? Protection, bi xie, right? They, drive or to uh, dispel evil or whatever. What is the purpose of all this? People are seeking prosperity. People are seeking protection. People are seeking well-being. That's the heart of a fallen creature. But what I mean is this. Actually, those things in and of themselves are not, not bad. They're not wrong in a sense because they're necessary The point is, the fallen human heart has no place for God, the true God, worshiping the true Lord. They don't put God first because they don't think it's necessary because they don't know who he is. They think that they are first, their needs are first, and God is there to serve and meet their every need. This is the essence of idolatry, thinking that God exists to serve me. It doesn't matter if you worship a Buddhist statue or Jesus. Either way, it's idolatry. It's not the external form that it takes. It's the heart behind what you're doing. It's the motive. It's the pursuit. What are you seeking? What are you after? What are you valuing? That's idolatry. And the funny thing is, the scary thing about this story is these people are not Philistines. They're not Canaanites. They're not flagrantly worshiping Baal. They're actually, they actually think that they're worshiping Yahweh. So everything they do has a vague resemblance of the true. But it's nothing but a copy. I heard it said once, a report came back from India Because in America, there began a sort of Christianity in this last generation that is sort of like, let's call it a copy of true Christianity. But it's not the real thing. But it's very popular. And it draws a lot of people. And the report came back from India now. Now in India, they have a copy of the copy. In other words... The American version was already off. It was already false. It was already a false. It was a copy of the real thing. It was not the real thing. 
But certain people, individuals, whether they were foreigners or Indians, I don't know, took the copy back and made a copy of that in India. I remember years ago preaching in Mexico, and I went to a church where my friends warned me. They said, That's, you have to know what type of church it is. I said, well, as long as he's willing to let me preach, I'll preach there. He said, it's a kind of what they call a relevant church. In other words, they do like all the cool lights and all the fancy Hillsong style, whatever. But the thing is, my friends, they, they, they criticized it. They said, yeah, he tries to be relevant, but he doesn't even do it right. <laughs> so in other words, he tries to make it look cool, but it just looks dumb, you know what I mean? Anyway, if you're going to do it cool, at least do it right, you know, anyway. But, but that, what he had in Mexico was a copy of the copy. You understand? This cool, fashionable, modern, flashy, flashy fancy type of movement, motivating, motivational speaking, you know, always just encouragement and love, encouragement and love, encouragement and love. Now we do need that, and the Bible is full of that as well. But not only that, not only that, but that's all they give, encouragement and love, encouragement and love, blessing and blessing and God. He's going to make you the head and not the tail, and all their prophets travel around, and every year is the same prophecy. You know what they pro- prophesy? I can tell you the word of the Lord for 2025. I don't care what n- name of these so-called prophets that go around. I know what their word of the Lord from them will be next year. What? This is the year. <laughs> this is the year of greater blessing. This is a year of higher levels. That's always what they prophesy. It's always the same things. Always the same things. You, after a while, you, you, you step back and you realize this is nonsense. I don't care how dramatically you say it. Saying it a hundred times doesn't make it true. doesn't make it the word of the Lord. Anyway. Let me read some verses, some other verses. We've read just this Judges passage. But I, I want to give you an idea that this is... This, what we're looking at right here, in, in these issues, uh, what, the type of worship that, that's taking place here, listen, friends, this is a picture of humanity. This is not just, oh, that was a really dark era in the history of Israel. No, that's a picture of reality. You have to understand, you have to realize, the, book of, the Bible is a book of reality. It's describing Israel thousands of years ago true, but it's more than that. It's a prophetic picture of the human condition and the corruption of human religion. And so let's see this through some of the the prophets. Jeremiah 6.13, because this is Jeremiah describing their current, their uh, the current situation, because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. That's the marker of that generation in Israel, not the pagans outside, in Israel itself. What's the marker? What was the characteristic of them? They were all given to covetousness, greed, gain. And from the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. Wow, it's like he's talking about what was happening in in Judges. Yes, because this is the human condition outside of the, the power of God breaking in and bringing forth true repentance and bringing true light and true transformation and true revival. Verse 14, so they have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, where there is no peace. That's, that's what they do. The false prophets prophesy peace where there's no peace, just like we found the Levite doing there in the story. The Lord be with you. Peace be upon you. Go about your way. All will be well. Who are you? You don't know God. You don't have authority from God. You don't know what you're talking about. That's exactly right. And a lot of people that are so-called prophets today, that's exactly, they just spout things out of their mouth. Oh, I'm going to give a new word. I knew a guy who claimed to be a prophet, and he told me how he gives his prophecies. just makes them up. You understand that he makes them up. He goes up to them and says, oh, the Lord is showing me that next year is going to be your year of blessing and he's going to open doors for you and this and then that and whatever, et cetera, et cetera. He really told me that. He called it something different, but I call it making, he said, oh, I say it by faith. No, you're making stuff up. That's a lie. There's other places in Jeremiah it talks about the prophets steal the words from one another. 
In other words, they hear a good word over there. Oh, that's a good one. I'm going to take that for myself. And then they're going to proclaim it as if it's a word from the Lord. It's not a word from the Lord. It's a word from another false prophet. And then you have a whole circle, a whole circuit going. False prophets prophesying the same thing to everybody. It's a horrible picture of cor- the corruption of religion. Okay. Um, Jeremiah 30. I'm sorry, 530. 530. Just go back one chapter. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. Listen to this. Remember I said they work together, and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? The people love it so. Why? They're all working together for what? Gain, greed, prosperity, covetousness. Personal good, well-being. Their God is their belly, as Paul said, and God exists in their minds to serve them. And I've said this for years. I've told people that come to our church, I said, if your idea of God is like this, you better just go and get a Buddha and rub its belly. (laughs) Don't even bother to be a Christian. Why be a Christian if you're not going to serve the living God in the way that he commands us to in the way that he desires. If you want to use him for your own means, find a false god somewhere. (laughs) Go and worship an idol. Uh, Let's look at another one. Isaiah 39. That this, Isaiah 39, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, the seers are the prophets, Do not see. And to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. They don't want to hear it. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. They don't really say that. But they they say stuff like this. We don't want to hear about wrath and judgment. Jeremiah is always talking about wrath and judgment, wrath and judgment. They would mock him for it. Jeremiah, wrath and judgment, wrath and judgment. All you prophesy is wrath and judgment. They just have a little bit of a mockery. And so nobody's going to say, don't prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. No, no, no. He's, he's reading between the lines. He's seeing into their hearts and their motives and what they really think and speaking the quiet part out loud. People don't like it when you do that, you know. People do not like it when you do that. Now, it could be the very thing they were thinking, but just leave it there on the inside. Don't bring it out into the light. People get angry when you do that. Why did they hate Jesus? Jesus said himself, they hate me because I, because I, um, can, I can't think of the words. I was reading it in Chinese. Because, what, because I point out their sin. I point out that the things they do are wrong. That's why they hated Jesus. They hated Jesus because he brought the secrets of their heart out into public view. They weren't willing for that. They wanted to stay hidden down there. Don't bring it out. That's why people say, you are speaking against me when you preach on Sunday. You are purposely condemning me. I hope I was speaking to you. I hope I was. If you need to be condemned, I hope you. But it's not because I'm doing it on purpose. It's because the word of the Lord came, and the Lord himself brought secrets out into the light. Amen? I didn't finish this verse. So, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits, get out of the way, turn aside from the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease before us. Now, now, come on, guys. Let's just be, let's be uh, serious here for a moment. Like, these guys are religious. Micah was religious. The Levite was religious, and the Danites were religious. The Israelites are religious. What? Come on. And, they're, and they want to worship Yahweh. They want to worship the God of Israel. They want the God of Israel to bless them. So their so-called worship 
is towards the God of Israel. So why in the world? Well, they, it must be they're poor, deceived people. It must be that they just don't know the truth. Nobody ever told them. They, they, they just don't understand. They're, they're ignorant. That must be the reason why. Because, listen, they're religious, right? And they're trying to serve God, right? So it must just be a lack of understanding, a lack of teaching. Somebody needs to sit down with them and teach. No. That's not the problem. We see that very clearly from Isaiah 39. They don't want to hear it. Why don't they want, they want the blessing of God and they want to use some form of worship of God, but they don't want the real one. Why would they want a counterfeit? Why in the world would anybody want to settle for a counterfeit religion, a counterfeit Christianity? Because in the counterfeit, you are still Lord. In the counterfeit version, you can still do whatever you want. If you say, I'm going to give 1,100 pieces of silver, and later you change your mind and give 200, there's no one's going to say anything about it. If you take a post where you only get 10 shekels in a shirt per year, and somebody comes along and says, you can now be the priest of our whole tribe, and you say, that sounds good, I'll get more money, more influence, there's nobody's going to stop you. When gain is the goal, it's better to not have God in the picture. Why? Because anybody knows if you truly serve God, it will definitely cut into your gain in life, whether that's financially or relationally. When you truly serve God, there's going to be a sword that comes into the picture. There's no way around it. Everybody that truly follows Jesus Christ and lives out the gospel, there's going to be sacrifices, some people great sacrifices. In fact, in the Gospels, we often see that Jesus would tell rich people to sell everything they had and follow him. It was a common thing. There is a cost in following the true God. There is a price that must be paid to serve the true God. But when you serve the false one, it's close enough that it just makes you think you get the real thing, but you don't have to pay the price. You don't have to make the sacrifice. So get out of the way, true prophet. Turn aside from the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. We just want His blessings. We don't want His commandments. We just want His favor and His protection. We don't want to worship in spirit and in truth. We don't want to have to give up all of our idols. We don't have to want to live in accordance with His word. This, my friends, is why false religion thrives. It always has and it always will. False Christianity will thrive. It always has and it always will. Why? Because people want all the blessing, but they don't want to pay the price. Micah says it like this, Micah 2.11. If a man should walk in a false spirit and speak a lie, saying, I will prophesy to you of wine and drink, <laughs> even he would be the prattler of this people. Does anybody have the NIV? NIV? Can you read it? Is it Micah 2.11. I just want to see what it says in another version. Yes. Let me, let me see that. Excellent. I love the way that it's said here. <laughs> If a liar and deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer. That's, you see, that's a perfect match. Supernatural power to give us wine and beer, to give us the pleasures of the world, to give us the pleasures of the flesh. That would be just the prophet for this people. Well, I don't think I'm going to go very far into the next part. I'm just going to read maybe one verse, Matthew 10, 32. Because when we come to, that's the false. We discussed a bit of the false. 
The focus is your self gain. It's a copy of the real thing. Um, the purpose is, it, and it's set up, I have it like this. It's a counterfeit of the real thing. It's set up the wrong way, and it's set up for the wrong purpose. Okay, that's the false. So it's a counterfeit. It looks like it, but it's not the real thing. It's set up the wrong way. They're doing the wrong type of worship, and it's for the wrong purpose. Not for God to be worshipped, but for God to bow down and serve man. That's the false utilitarian religion that's gone throughout all of human history, actually. It's not a new thing, but it's prevalent today. But when we talk about true religion, Matthew 10, 32, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I thought he did. Well, apparently he didn't. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And I want to make this statement that the first point of true religion is there's a separation that takes place. Jesus came to bring a sword, a sword of division between the true and the false, between the pure and the impure, between the corrupt and and the pure, between the lie and the truth, between the false religion and true worship. Jesus came to bring division, a sword. In, in Matthew, he says to bring a sword. In Luke, it's the same verse, but he uses a different word. He came to bring division. So we understand the sword is a sword of division. And so he goes on. I did not come to bring peace but a sword, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me, now we start to understand what he means. Jesus did not come to bring destruction. He came to bring division. What sort of a division? Light and darkness. Truth and error. Purity and impurity. Those that serve God and those that serve the devil. He came to bring us a sword, a division in that sense. But the effective working of this sort of division, if you follow the ministry of Jesus, and there's many verses that um, go into this, everywhere it went, it talks about there was a division among the people after he came. Did you think that everywhere he went, he just brought peace and happiness? <laughs> no. Everywhere he went, he brought chaos and turmoil. Why? Because his word is bringing the dark things into the light. Because his word is exposing all the hypocrisy, all of the compromise, all of the deception, all of the false religion. It's bringing all that into the light, and he's raising up a standard and saying, this is what God is calling you to now choose this day whom you will serve. And those that follow the new standard, they're in a totally different world now. And those that won't do it, now they become like somehow, um, what's the word, um, alienated. And it could happen in the same family, between a husband and a wife, a brother and a sister, a mother, mothers and children and children and parents. They were once all in the same family, but now one has accepted the laws of the kingdom of God. They've surrendered their lives to God Almighty, and now we've got a husband saying, Honey, don't go to church. You can't go to church. She's like, I must obey Jesus. I'm sorry. I won't obey you as my husband. I'll honor you, but you cannot command me to do things that go opposite to what Jesus commanded. commanded. So now you have a division in the family. And now, if you're Chinese, and then you've got, oh, well, we're going to come, it's the, the Qingmingjie, we're going to go to the, uh, you know, Saomua, we're going to go, and we're going to, uh, bye-bye, Deba Xiaoxiang. No, I'm sorry, I'm not going. Oh, don't worry, you can find yourself a hundred pastors on YouTube that'll tell you, it's okay, God understands. Go ahead and pray to Jesus while you're bowing down there, worshiping idols. That's a false lie. Lie. I knew a girl in China. 
She was, later became a pastor. And she was very excited about her idea. She said, well, I teach our people when they have to go and, you know, bow, you know, bow to their graves or whatever. And just, just do it, but just in your heart, just say, I'm praying to Jesus. It's, it's a total compromise. It's a total compromise. Tell that to Daniel and his friends. Daniel's three friends. Oh, yeah, okay, oh, oh, bow down and worship the statue. Lord, I'm bowing down at their command to worship the statue, but in my heart, you know I'm not really bowing to the statue. I- I'm bowing to you, Lord God. I'm- Are you kidding, man? Give me a break. Or how about Daniel? No prayer to anybody except the king. Oh, Lord, I'll just pray in my heart then very silently and very quietly and very fearfully. There would be no Daniel. There would be no Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There'd be none of these great men of God. Why are they great? Because they stood for truth. They would not compromise for the sake of convenience. Truth is not always convenient and it's not always comfortable. Okay, I don't know where I read to, but I'm going to start at verse 36. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. This is coming back to true worship. It starts at self-denial. True worship will never begin with your felt needs. Never. It's not true worship. It's selfish worship. God may give you a miracle in your needy state. He did it all the time in the Gospels. He gave them loaves. He gave them fishes. But later the day came along and he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood or get lost. And most of them decided to get lost. That means go away. Colloquial English. They never knew the true worship of God. They had miracles happen. But you will not know the true worship of God until you deny yourself, until you take up your cross, until you follow Jesus. Another word for this is simply this, repentance. Turn away from the world, the flesh, and the devil, and give your life to serve God. So, the first point of the true worship of God is this, that God made the world, think about that, if you made a toy, a toy, plastic little toy with a battery that can talk, and this little toy wants to talk to you and serve me, feed me, recharge my battery, take me to the park to play, protect me. You exist to serve me. That's a joke. It's a joke. You make a toy, and you're going to serve. Oh, I bow down. Oh, oh, what do you need, toy? I will serve you all that. Or, oh, I mean, come on. But we actually think God exists to serve us. That is the default state of human, con- the human condition. They literally think that God exists and owes them life, owes them blessing, owes them stuff. That's why when things go wrong for people and there's tragedies, they blame God and they hate God because they feel like God owes them blessing, owes them protection, owes them all these things, whether they're wicked or not. And it's utterly false, utterly, completely, tragically false. There's no truth in it whatsoever. God can pick us up and toss us into hell and it it has absolutely no bearing on anything whatsoever. Everything goes on as it was. You and I can completely not exist and it affects nothing. God is God, eternal, almighty, sovereign God of the whole universe. He does not exist to serve us. He does not exist to meet our needs. He does not exist to give us what we want. We are his creation. He is not our creation. We exist for him. 
his purpose and his will, not vice versa. So this is the first point of establishing true religion. The focus must turn from self to God. Living my own life, whatever I had planned, whatever I thought I'd like to do with my life, that's not serving God. Though in the false religion, though it talks about God and sometimes is very zealous for God, ultimately, though, the focus is still on me and what, I can, what, what I'm going to get out of doing these good things rather than wait, I exist for God. And I get blessed along the way, no doubt. God is gracious and kind, and he loves us, and he provides for us. That's why he sent his son as a savior. But, but there's this horrible root that goes deep within us that wants to put ourselves first and put our lives first and, and wants God to bow down and be our butler, which is my last name, by the way, <laughs> be our servant. I'll be your servant, but God won't be our servant. Amen? We can serve one another, and we serve God. And there's actually, shockingly, there's verses that in a sense talk about how God serves those that wait upon him. I mean, it's like God so humbles himself that he will stoop down and bless us and help us. And it's true. And Jesus bowed down and washed the feet of his disciples. So the character of God is, is very humble in that sense understand what I'm saying, but we must not mistake that to mean that we can use him for our own means, that he is like just our genie in the sky, and we can just like rub the belly and get what we want, or, the, or that he owes us something or whatever. On the other hand, he is very gracious and very kind and very and full of mercy and compassion. And this was the lesson that Job learned. That's what James tells us later. That he learned that God was full of mercy and compassion. Yeah, that's, that's something that's true, something that God wants us to know. But somehow we have to balance that truth with the reality that we are created for God, by God, to serve God, not the other way around. If people understood this, I think it would not be hard to get more people full-time preaching the gospel, more people active in the church, more people that would... Just maybe they work a regular job, but their whole heart and mind is all on the things of the kingdom. It would be normal. But because we've been, we've, we've been sold a false bill of goods, that you can have the best of this world and Christianity also, it's all at the same time. People are just used to living in, in both worlds at the same time. No, we have to live in both worlds at the same time. We can't get out, go out of this world, and we, can't, we have to do the normal things of this life, and most people have to work a regular job and provide for their family, etc. I'm not saying that's not a part of, of course. Paul said if you don't work, you don't eat. It's one thing to have to work, but it's like William Carey, I think it was, said that um, my, my, I forget the exact word, but my, basically my career is winning souls. I mend shoes to pay my way. Paul was a tent maker. A lot of the time he paid his own way so he could go and preach the gospel. But why is it that so few Christians are, are active in these ways? I mean, the most active Christian is one that comes to sun, not only to church on Sunday, but like Wednesday night as well. It's like, wow, it's already like radical modern Christianity. That's false Christianity, my friends. Real Christianity is your whole heart, soul, body, everything is given over to God. Now, it doesn't mean you're in church every day of the week, but you're serving God somehow, somewhere every day of the week. Amen? It's a focus on God. 